Hello, this is the AI Lab. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Elisa Giommi, an associate professor at Roma Tre University, Department of Philosophy, Communication and Performing Arts, and the commissioner of AGICOM, the Italian Communications Regulatory Authority. Professor Giommi is the author of a wide array of publications for major Italian and international publishers and peer-reviewed journals. The reason? A recent contribution written by Dr. Giomi on the International Institute of Communications website entitled The Almost Unacknowledged Revolution of AI in the Media and Creative Industries. Let's hear what Elisa has to say. Thank you so much for being with us today, Commissioner Giomi. And let me start with my first question, which is how does the impact of AI, artificial intelligence, on media and creative industries compared to historical technological revolutions, such as Gutenberg's printing press, in terms of cultural and social transformation? Well, it seems to me that artificial intelligence, especially generative AI, places itself in continuity, I would say, with other technological innovations. And this is for at least two reasons. First, um, because the revolution produced by AI in the media and creative industries, as many previous ones, will probably be declared a revolution only long after it happened. It's something that occurred also to uh, Gutenberg's printing press that we were mentioning, as noted by the famous historian Elizabeth Einstein in her fascinating book, which I strongly recommend. It's called The Printing Press as an Agent of Change from 1979. Um, Einstein noted that the revolutionary effect of the press was uh, kind of underestimated due to the focus of historians on its role in disseminating new ideas, which is correct. But the real novelty, according to Eisenstein, concerned what nowadays we would call the brain frame, as readers for the first time were enabled to see several texts together and compare them, stalking, elaborating, re-elaborating information in a totally new way. Now, the same, in my view, is happening today with the application of AI in the media sector. Its disruptive effect goes unnoticed because when it comes to um, AI, the media and creative industries remain under the radar in the public debate. Since they are not among the leading adoption fields, I presume, compared, for instance, to the financial sector or the telecommunication sector. Despite this, the importance of AI in the media is such that Two of the winners of the last Pulitzer Prize for journalism admitted using AI system in their investigation and getting so much, so many benefits from AI. The second reason why the AI revolution looks like the main technological revolution of the past, in my view, is its um, ability to divide, to polarize, indeed, the public debate between enthusiasts on the one end and radical opponents on the other, as in the case of any other technological and media innovation, starting from electricity, I would say. Uh, th thank you. you. You made me smile with the, the polarization. It is, it is quite uh, striking. Um, now, with um, generative AI's rise in me media, and you mentioned the Pulitzer Prize uh, examples, 
how should we navigate uh, the balance between the benefits of AI, for example, in combating misinformation, like detecting deep fakes, and the risks that it poses, such as the potential for actually creating convincing fake, fake news? Well, that's the question, I would say. And thank you for making it. Uh, well, fake news or information disorder represent an exception to the uh, underestimation of the uh, AI revolution in the media and creative industries. If you, if you think about it, all the occasions when the impact of AI on the media has burst into the public sphere concern fake news and produce real consequences. For instance, um, in May 2023, a fake picture of a Pentagon at the quarters bombing went viral, causing the Dow Jones Index to lose 85 points real consequences to fake news. You know what I mean? More recently, the faces and voices of famous actors were reproduced and used without them knowing to support Russia's propaganda against Ukraine. So on social media networks, these fake interviews with Brad Pitt and other actors are making very, very negative statements against them. Zelensky um, received thousands of views before it was known that these were synthetic videos, that is, videos created by AI. Mm. Clearly, similar events provoke extreme concern, but we should remember that every technological innovation has been a Accompanied by a source of um, squinting effect, which leads to amplifying the distorted uses to the detriment of the more abundant beneficial applications. Um, in other terms, demonizing AI for fear of its side effects would be as if in the past we had refused to switch from the plow to the tractor for fear that the tractor could pollute or run over people and animals. Going back to fake news, AI is not only used to produce fake news and misleading content, but also in fact-checking and in identifying deep fakes. Therefore, it is used also in fighting this information itself. For instance, in view of the uh, elections that um, are to be held in many countries in 2024, very popular video sharing platforms have started to use AI to recognize and label as deepfake all the videos created by AI and uploaded by users. In my view, it is only by taking into account opportunities and risks at the same time that we will be able to develop a balanced regulation and to avoid emergency and um, radical responses in the wake of moral panics produced by misuses of AI such those I, I mentioned. And final point, if I may, um, from this point of view, as a media scholar, I can't help but notice that um, as far as Europe is concerned, the uh, AI Act does not include the media sector among the high-risk sector. Now, I do believe that the uh, AI Act is a very effective initiative but I cannot agree with the exclusion of media.
provided their delicate role, their crucial role in society. Unlike other industries, the media produce symbolic or meaning-making goods, that is, goods which are likely to shape our perception of the world and to guide our choices. So I think they should have been included in the high-risk sector. I'm not sure the media is going to like you here on that one, but... Um... One of the statements you made in, in the article is um, that artificial intelligence and human intelligence follow a not dissimilar logic. Uh, and, and you conclude that we should not use a double standard to regulate them, which, which is interesting because that's exactly what's happening, a double standard at the moment. Now, considering the ongoing debate around copyright and artificial intelligence, both when it comes to training data or input and output, what should a balanced approach look like? Well, copyright, in my view, is a perfect case study of the challenges encountered in seeking the balanced regulatory approach we, we are talking about. Um, as it is well known, the intersection between generative AI and copyright law came to collective attention with the New York Times complaint against OpenAI, which prompted, prompted the many news media and platforms to, uh, to prevent uh, um, chat GPT crawlers um, from accessing the content. Mm, focusing again on Europe, uh, the copyright regulation is um, trying to address these and the other issues raised by artificial intelligence from two point of view, I would say, from two sides. First one is considering the idea of providing forms of economic remuneration, the so-called fair compensation um, from AI-based services to publishers. Second, uh, the issue is uh, uh, approached um, requiring the uh, authorization of the uh, right holders for any use of copyright protected content. Uh, let me uh, explain by starting from the first point I made. Uh, here, uh, personally, I have strong misgivings uh, about the uh, remuneration hypothesis because I believe, um, I believe it um, privileges publishers over any other content producers uh, which don't claim compensation uh, when their data are used by uh, AI-based services and chatbots to, to, for their training. Now, uh, the uh, authorization scheme provided by the uh, AI Act I was mentioning um, is a scheme which uh, looks like as a, as a reasonable solution from my point of view. But at the same time, uh, there is a, a paradoxical argument I'd like to develop, to elaborate, in order to highlight the double standard we use in front of human intelligence on the one hand and artificial intelligence on the other. And this double standard, in my view, has to be overcome if we want to achieve a well-balanced regulation. Um, the paradoxical argument is the following. Mm, the claim for fair compensation for publishers when AI-based services use their content is justified on the basis that uh, these AI uh, services and apps use um, newspaper uh, 
or other copyrighted content for profit. That is, these services think about chat bots. Hmm? And monetize by providing us, the users, with answers that are based on the content of newspaper or other mm, copyrighted content. But uh, human beings uh, do the same. Very often we take advantage, so to speak, from copyrighted protected content for profit. That is, um, we use uh, this content to learn new things and sometimes in order to monetize from the knowledge acquired by studying and uh, reading newspaper and copyrighted content. For example, I um, aim to get a well-remunerated job through studying. Nevertheless, nobody thinks a, a, a flesh and blood person should ask for permission from the copyright owner before reading a newspaper, unlike what happens with chatbots. In short, sometimes I'm not sure having different rules for the human mind on the one end and the artificial mind on the other makes sense. And this is the meaning of the provocative statement you, you quoted. Um, here, my conclusion here is that um, maybe it's too early to find a solution to the copyright problems raised by AI. Anyway, I believe that any balanced regulation must have two starting points. The first one is a rigorous analysis of the real value chain. Who earns more and from whose services? And second, we should take into account a precise diagnosis. We are supposed to regulate only when there is a pathology to be healed for real. Um, th thank you so much and, and a surprising statement for someone who's active uh, with the regulator <laughs> to, to be a uh, light touch. Um, I encourage everyone to read your article. I also encourage everyone to read uh, the Gutenberg uh, analysis that you pointed out towards. And thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Giomi, and look forward to reading more of you on AI and other topics. Thank you so much for having me here for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, podcast series.